see that yesterday we were working hard to um, bring life back to uh, an of, above ground Walmart pool <laughs> and, um, and, and being able to get the dirty water out so that we can replace it with clean water was a huge thing and we were thanking God for the miracles of his world and the scientific things like siphoning, which was, was very helpful. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this world that you have made and our place in it. Thank you for what we can learn by our experiences of life in your world. And also thank you for the amazing word that is found in Scripture that allows us a lens by which to see all things. May we use them together as, as the psalmist kind of brings us to and as he says, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be redeemed in you, my rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning I want to get right into the psalm. This is Psalm 19. Um, and then I want to talk about it, how it's set up. I want to kind of go through it. Um, some of the key phrases introduce an important meaning that is found in this psalm. I want to pair it with the New Testament, and I want to think about it in our own context, so we've got a lot going on, and we want to get going. Um, if you can, this would be a good time to have a pew Bible out um, to, to look at some of these things that I'm going to bring out, but, but first I want to read it um, just as it is. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour, th pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the others. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord, Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, in doing this, there is, no, there is no quiz, there is no test, there is no anything. It is merely to give you some um, background, some ground on, in which this is happening. So I'm going to throw out a lot of things at once. You're not necessarily going to grasp all of it. You don't need to, right? Take this as it comes um, and, 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 and grasp onto what you think is, is important because it's all here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this line for line, and I'm going to talk about some, not all, but some of the choices that are made in translation here, because there are a lot of possibilities. Um, so I want to start with the first part, and I want to bring out, again, last week I talked about how this is connected to Genesis 1. This, again, is... If you look, the heavens declare the glories of God. That heavens word, there's multiple words they could use, but this one is heavens hashemayim, which is the same word they used back in Genesis 1. Literally, it means the waters, the waters, right? Because you remember that God separated water from the water. Water is what we have down here. The water is what is up there. The water, because it's blue and the firmament holds it together. The, heaven, the word for declare here is misapparent. Now, 
The point of telling you what that word is is not so that you remember what misaparim is. But just remember, in this psalm at all, they are going to use all different words to, to, to basically say the same thing. We heard statutes, we heard commands, we heard this, we heard that, we heard words, we had voids, we had all this. This one is one of them. Misaparim means declare. That's not going to be used again. The heavens declare this. The skies, that's the firmament. It's the same word from Genesis 1 for the firmament. That thing that holds the water up there and gives us life down here. That proclaims. So we use declare, now proclaims, which is um, magi, another word. A different word that talks about basically the same thing. The firmament is haraki, right? It sounds hard, haraki. That's the thing that holds the water up there. This is one of my favorites, line three. Day after day, they pour forth speech. I love how he says day after day. Your own lay your own. Your own lay your own. Day after day. Almost sounds like it does in English, right? Your own lay your own. Omer this time, speech. Yaviva. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Now, as cool as day after day is, night after night is that much prettier. Valea lelea, night after night. Valea lelea. Now, this is reveals knowledge. Yahweh. What does that sound like? Yahweh. Does it sound like Yahweh, God Himself? That's the revealing. How awesome is that? That revealing is the very same root as God Himself. The at reveals what? Knowledge, fact, the thing. The it. That's what this is about. Night after night, knowledge is revealed. Now, in this psalm, it's talked a lot about speech and declaring this after that. He goes and says, they have no speech. They use no words. Now, the psalmist is using nothing but words. And he uses word after word, different words to, to say the same thing. But the world doesn't need to do that. It just doesn't. They use no speech. And it's cool in Hebrew, it's, it, it doesn't have all the extra prepositional words. It just says, no voice, no speech, no words. We add in that extra to make it sound right in English. No speech, no voice, no <coughs> words. Yet, their voice. How cool is that? He says, no voice, but then he says, yet their voice. And he uses the same word there. No voice, but a voice. Irony. Their voice goes out into the entire world. And this time he says their line. As if it's their perfect, like a line in a play. It's their job. It's their role. The director says, say this, and they say it. That's how their speech comes forth. And it goes to the ends of the world. Why does it go to the end of the world? Because that's what the sun does. It says, in heaven God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's not that he pitched a tent for the sun. The word is tabernacle. It's the same word that they use to house God as they move through the desert. Right? They pitch a tent for them. It's the first thing that goes. It moves all the time. It's not a tent that stays. It's a tent that moves. And it's the sun moving across the heaven. Now, how does it move? It says, like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. That's ready to go. <laughs> That's ready to go. And if that's not ready enough to go, then he says, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. He's so excited about what he has just done, and he's excited about what he's going to do all day. And for those of you that think the, the world is flat, and think that the ancient people thought the world was flat, and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. But a better thing than warmth is it's actually heat. It's like the life-giving heat within us is the sun, connection in the sun. Now, he goes through all of that just to describe how the words of the Lord are being described in God's creation. It's pretty impressive. That's, that's the beauty of the images that he's bringing forth. Now he switches it to the law. 
It's as if he switches from the world to the scripture, to the book. Because he says this, the law of the Lord is perfect. That's Torah, right? We've heard that word before, Torah. And it says Torah of Yahweh, the, the name that can't be named. So that's why it's, this, it's translated as Lord. The Torah of <coughs> Yahweh is perfect, refreshing the soul. Now, the word for refreshing could also be trade converting. It converts the soul, means it changes it, it redeems it, it causes us to repent. That is all picked up in there. It, but the, the word for soul is nephesh. Um, one of the other times that nephesh is used when it says, um, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? There's the soul part is nephesh. That's like the, the Hebrew saw that as the essence of you, right? So it refreshes your very being. The statutes, right? So it said law, now it says statutes. Um, the word is edu, it can mean testimony, it can mean statutes, it can mean other things. But the key that I want you to realize is that it's different than law, right? It's, he's taking and changing the word to something else. But again, it's of Yahweh, and it says that they are sure, ne emana, no problem, right? Like, I like that it almost sounds like ne emana. How you doing? Nehemiah? No problem. I'm good. That's how the, the statutes or the testimony of the Lord is no problem. It's there. It's no, it's, it, is, it is without question. And that makes wise the simple. The precepts, this time it's pikude, which can be statutes again or precepts um, of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart and led there, Lebab is the same heart as what was in, um, you know, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, all that. It's the same thing, Lebab, but heart, they, they thought as something within us that that's where the thinking happens. They didn't think that thinking happens in the brain. They thought that the heart is the source of your, your thinking. So when they're saying that giving joy to that, making peace in your mind so that you can be happy with the world as it is. This time commands of the Lord are radiant. Commands is mitzvot. It's the same word that's used to talk about the Ten Commandments. So he's gone from Torah to precepts and statutes now to commands are radiant. And here's an interesting word because he's going to say, um, he's going to use pure a couple of different times here. This one is, the word is better as pure, but it's, it's like purified by fire. It's the kind of pure that is made whole by burning it and then making it what's left is pure. That's pure. Um, and that gives life, gives light to the eyes. And the word for <coughs> eyes is cool because it sounds like English. It's anayim. Anayim, eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure. Remember I talked about pure before and said that it was like burning. This is pure that's like clean. Clean. One is purified, like burning it till there's nothing left except what's the essence. This is pure as if it was made clean. It was dirty and then you washed it up. And the fear here is the same word for fear that's found in Proverbs, which says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Fear. And this cleanness endures forever. The last, the decrees, this is mispeat, judgments, the judgments of the Lord are firm, and that's a better tr uh, translation of the idea of true. And it says, and all of them are righteous, as, as if righteousness and truth were connected and they could not be separated. That's basically what this says. We add some words in English to make it make sense, but basically what it says, the decrees of the Lord are true and they are righteous. And that means that they are firm. They cannot be moved. Now the psalmist switches from what the laws are to how good they are. And listen to a couple of things. They are more precious than gold. The word precious here means to be desired. They're more desired than gold. It has nothing to do with them being scarce. It has to do with how much our hearts desire gold. And then he says, then much pure gold, not just gold, but the best gold, the greatest gold, the word he uses is rob for much. 
Remember that word, Rob. I'm going to say it a couple of times here because this psalmist who has used so many words all of a sudden is going to get real friendly with one word. That's this word, Rob, great. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the whole honeycomb. Again, not only does he use the image of the honeycomb being that pure source of the honey, unadulterated, unchanged, but he also says, he uses Rob here, much greater, the best honey that you can have. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. What do you think the word that goes with reward here that's translated great is? Rob, the same word for how good the gold is and how good the honey is. The reward is that great. And keep, keep, keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive me my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from will, willful sins. It's interesting how he puts this together. He says, hidden and willful, right? So who are they hidden from? Not hidden from God, because that would be impossible. Hidden from myself, the ones I don't even know about, right? There, there are sins that I do that I have no clue about. You know God, but I don't, right? And that makes sense with the other, the willful sins are the ones that are presumptuous. The ones that, so there's these sins that I don't even know I do. And then there's these sins, well, yeah, God, I'm going to do those anyway. Right? So he's, he's covering all of them. And he's saying, take care of me. Because there are some sins that I don't even know I do that only you know about. And then there's these other ones, yeah, I know them, but I keep doing them anyway. <laughs> May they not rule over me. He says, may these sins, whether they are ones that I don't know about or ones that I do anyway, may they not be my master. May they not be the ruler. May they not have dominion over me, which is exactly the word that used. When else is the word dominion used? Back in Genesis 1, where human beings are given dominion over creation. So do not let my sins take my place in your holy created order. Because that's what happens. We allow our sins to take our place and rule over us and rule over the rest of creation. How? In a bad way. Again, he says, then I will be blameless. I will be innocent of great transgression. What word does he use again? Rob. He uses it four times. To describe the greatness of the gold, to describe the greatness of the honey, to describe the greatness of the world reward, and then to describe the greatness of the sin and transgression that you can save me from through this knowledge. Great, 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 great. He ends with, may the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart again, Labab, be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, my strength. And my Redeemer is a better translation of strength than rock, actually. Look at how the words that he used, may the words of my mouth here, that's different from the nation, from the word he uses later to describe that the, that the natural world has no words to use. So again, the number of words he uses to, just, to talk about the way that God has made the world is really impressive. How many words the Hebrew language has about the things that God does and how impressive it is. And he uses all of them here, but he describes one thing, the greatness, using one again, again, again. Why? I think for emphasis. For emphasis of the great reward as opposed to the great transgression. There's obvious beauty in this language, um, and you could sit there and study it for days. I tried to pick some of the, the major parts that were there, some of the memorable images like natural and created worlds singing the glory of God. As I was talking to the girls, we come closest to this idea of singing when we sing joy to the world. And we say heaven and nature sing and repeating the sounding joy, 
right? Those are the things that, we're, we, that we come closest to that image. The sun as bringing of light and heat to the world and knowledge is another great image, right? The sun bringing light and knowledge and heat. The excitement of a bridegroom makes us chuckle a little bit. The dedication of a champion. How does Michael Jordan wake up in the morning and go about doing his business playing basketball back in the early 90s with joy as a champion? Running the circuit every day, day after day, night after night, so that the entire world can see. The claims that this psalmist is making, this Jewish psalmist is making, is not just to the Jews, but to the entire world. Because the entire world can see the sun. The entire world can see the work of God's hands. It's for everyone. But then he goes through all the different proclamations and statutes of the Lord, the laws and the commands, the fear, all of that. Why does he connect these two things together? The heavens calling out the glory of the world and the book itself, the scriptures itself saying what it is that God is. What is it about the two of them together? The law, the book, the wisdom, and the natural created world. Some would call this the truth and the science. And, and, and our contemporary voice says, wait a second, I thought those were forever at odds. I've heard that from both sides of the argument, from the science side and from the, uh, the Christian side. Whenever it suits us right, we, we, we divide it. Don't you have to be a science denier to be a Christian? Don't you have to be a Christian denouncer to believe in the science? If you were to look at the world today and the discussion that takes place in the culture, you might think that. I had a politician this week come and start claiming that when life happens was a religious question and it depended on which religion you are, what the truth was about that. And I'm like, isn't that a science question? I, on the other side, I heard a, a, a song that was actually was being ridiculed by someone, but it was a, a Christian song about creation and about how we're not evolved from monkeys. And it was like sung in a church, proudly as all, Listen to me, we, evolution is horrible and, and this is what we are and how dare you question it. This is the typical dividing line. The question is, when did that happen? Here the writer of Psalm 19 seems to claim that they are in line with each other and must always be. The truth of the Lord is written on the creation of the world. He connects it all together. The creation, the created water, order, look, um, the law, sins, it's all here and it's all together. Why would we ever split it apart? Look at the claim he makes about God's law. There is a great reward for following them. Great. The same tangible great as the desire for gold and the sweetness of the very best honey. He's not describing the great reward as something that's ethereal, that's later in life and in the future in heaven after we die. He's talking about the greatness of the world, the greatness of the reward for following the law happening right here, right now. The great size of transgression, though, he also calls to the table. And that is avoided when these statutes are, are followed. As a session, as our um, devotion on Thursday, we looked at Psalm 12. If you ever look at Psalm 12, that's the one that talks about how the world has gone mad and nobody trusts anyone and it's just falling apart. It goes out of its way in Psalm 12, describe a world where God's decrees are not followed, are forgotten, and lost completely. 
And what happens when God's laws are forgotten is lies and corruption follow. Because the way that we're living doesn't match the way that we're created. And that when that happens, things fall apart. Psalm 19 instead paints a world of truth, seamless, all-encompassing, and lined up in order truth. We should be able to see the same thing when we look at the world and when we look at the book. We should be able to look at the book and look at the world and be like, oh, these things match. This is true. This is reality. But maybe we're too caught up in the wrong things when we try to do that. Maybe Jesus shows us a little bit of this in the Gospels and his dealing with the Pharisees. This is one of my favorite encounters. This is Luke 12, 54 to 56. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it you don't know how to interpret this present time? Look at what Jesus is saying to them. You can tell the earth and the sky, but you don't know what it means anymore. You allow them to be separate. You allow to, you have your religious teaching, and you have your here and now teaching, your experiential teaching, and they're not the same. There's a divide between them. You can tell the earth and the sky, but you don't know what it means anymore. You can tell weather, but you can't see God in the weather. You come to me to follow me because I do wonders, but you don't see God in those wonders. You just see me as a magician. Why? Because you separate them from each other. You don't see the world as one amazing place designed and created by God. What do you see God in, and what don't you? The Pharisees know the law, and the Pharisees know the skies, but they don't know how they're connected together. They stop looking for the connection at some point. Because maybe the Roman world was so crazy that they couldn't see God in it anymore. Maybe that's the case. But somewhere in the truth, they should be able to find that, and they've lost it. The Pharisees know the law. They know the promise of the Messiah. But they don't know Jesus standing in front of them being both. Why? Because they know things. They know lots of things, but they don't connect them together. They probably know how many days the world was created in. They probably know how many animals were lined up two by two on the boat. They probably know that Daniel stood amongst some lions. They probably know that Jonah was eaten up by a fish. They probably know that the temple was destroyed. But what they don't know is the entire picture together. They don't see how those stories and those things line up, not necessarily to be something, but to show us the amazing wonder of God. And if we get caught up in the facts and the memorization of this, that, and the other, we can miss the entire picture. And I swear that those, those people I saw in that video singing that creation hymn have lost picture. Because what they did was they put on a jersey and said, this is my Christian jersey, and that's all that matters. There's that old phrase, too heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. There's another one that I think is too science minded, but you don't know what it all means. Is it possible that you could become so biblically minded that you become anti-science? And the truth is, if you're listening to Psalm 19, that's an impossibility. Because you become a contradiction to yourself. Is it possible when right here it says, the Bible says, they should come together, they should be one in the same. Seeing God in all things. Because the teams that we're on, the jerseys that we're on, that we create, what they do is they reduce faith to believing in hard-to-believe facts. Believing in hard-to-believe facts. The more difficult the fact is to believe in, the greater the faith. 
But is that really what faith is? Or is faith having a relationship with God? So tight that you see God everywhere, in everything, and in every person. Or that you become, you come to Him with such an open and humble heart that you're ready to listen and learn rather than put your forth your own speech to the world. You're rather to listen to what the world has to teach you, what God's created world has to teach you, than stating your claim on what you think is true. Is faith being a ship at sea, and when the storm comes up, and that you don't lose your head, and you don't lose your faith, and you don't start blaming, and you don't start pointing fingers, and you don't start worthing, and you don't change your character, but you see God in the storm, your eyes are open to God in the storm. And that storm might be a storm. That storm might be disease. That storm might be pain. That storm might be a difficult situation. That storm might be the death of a loved one. That storm might be the loss of a job. That storm might be any number of things. Do you stay firm in that storm? That's what faith is. Being able to stay the same person with the same faith, the same trajectory through whatever happens. Is faith being able to see your neighbor as part of God's glorious creation made in his image? Is faith being able to deny yourself and take up the cross? If you look in Luke 12, Luke 12 is probably the most difficult chapter in all of Luke. And that's where this part is about seeing the weather in the sky and all that. Look at those challenges. Look at everything that's found in that chapter. This is Jesus ramping it up, saying this is what faith is, and it's a hard thing. And it'd be a lot easier to just separate those things out and not have to worry so much. But Jesus holds faith above all things, and Paul does too when he says that faith is the answer to our salvation. Is it being able, is faith being able to live a faith here, now, in the present to know God and to know that God created the heavens and the earth? To know that God created the heavens and the earth, regardless of how God created the heavens and the earth. That is so much more important. And that's what's being spoken here of by the science. And if you read that rest of Luke 12, you will see how very harsh and how very wonderful that promise is. I wanted to read a poem. This book was given to me by my uncle. Samuel Davies is one of the first Presbyterian ministers, or he is the first licensed in Virginia to preach. Um, and he is an ancestor of ours. Um, he wrote this poem back in the mid-1700s when he lived. It's called Science, an Ode. And just in case you start to think that Samuel Davies was some liberal <laughs> such and such, um, he wrote and, pre and preached some sermons that were so hellfire and brimstone they'd make your toes curl. Right? This is not exactly what's going on here. But this, listen to what he said. This is science. Science with an exclamation point. Bright beam of light divine. Dawn of immortal day. On this thy new built temple shine and all thy charms display. He's using the language of Psalm 19 to bring that out. He, fi he finishes it with hail science, heaven born stranger. Hail adorn thy humble shrine. Deign in this western world to dwell. And it's wide ways for fine. This is, this is a person and a, and, a, and a people and a time. The time that built this nation. That did not separate science and faith. May we be wary of such things. Whether they come from either side. We should also know that when those attack the facts of creation or whatever in the Bible, 
They're attacking the facts of the story, not because they care about the facts of the story, but they care about the truth of the story, which is that God created the heavens and the earth. They'll nitpick the facts because they can't deny the truth. In the same way that when they want to attack the Declaration of Independence, they don't attack that. They attack Jefferson as a slaveholder. The same idea. Undermine something to take out the big thing. May we always hold to that big thing. God created the heavens and the earth each day, day by day, and night by night. Ba'om le'om, ba'ela la'lela. Amen. We talked at worship committee also, um, I brought up that one of the things I thought that we had missing was um, the idea of praying for each other by name in the service. And so I want to, at least as a start of, of bringing those things back, to give in the middle of this prayer a moment of silence. And in that moment of silence, you can offer names or prayers or whatever out loud or to yourself. Um, as part of bringing those ideas back. And we might move forward beyond that after this. But let us pray. Heavenly Father, may we see your glory all around us. May we be clothed in your wonders. May we see the world as a connected place that we don't compartmentalize, but we see the entire picture in each one thing. That, that we see the entire picture in one thing and that we see in one thing the entire picture, that it's, that it's all connected. May we connect together all of the aspects of our lives, our relationships, our work, our, our mission, our family, internally and externally, whatever it is that we have, may we all see them as connected and live them as connected as you would have us do. Be with those who we that are in this congregation and in our lives who we um, truly love and who are in need of prayer. May we say their names either in the silence of our hearts or out loud in this moment. Heavenly Father, we hold up these names and so many others, whether we voice them in voice or in the silence of our hearts, you hear it all, you know it all. Even before we speak the words or think the thought, you are already there knowing our need and taking care of them. Shepherd us, O oh Lord, through all that we face, and may our hearts be so connected to you that everything we face we are the same. May that hope be in us. That hope that is connected to character and perseverance. And your amazing promise that we have through faith. We say all these things made true by our rock and our redeemer, Jesus Christ. And we close this prayer saying the words that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.